Thank you, Mr. Crow. There is uh, one particular scripture that uh, I love, especially in these times of trouble, a lot of challenges in life. And uh, there's a scripture that describes exactly what is going on, and it's very timely. I'd like to go to uh, Romans uh, uh, chapter 8 and verse 22, so that you can check this scripture in Romans 8 verse 22. So first of all, let me say grace, peace, and joy uh, to you all in the name of Jesus Christ. Verse 22 of Romans 8 says, We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. But isn't that a good description of what is happening now? The whole creation, the whole world, we see this for not only this time, but for centuries and millennia. The whole creation has been groaning in, in labor pains until now. I like this uh, particular metaphor, this analogy, where it kind of shows uh, like a mother giving birth. I, I you know, understand how this is because uh, uh, all my three kids, when they were born, I was there. I was there to, to witness and my wife giving birth and I experienced her, her groaning. Ah! You know, <laughs> giving birth. You know, and that's the husband. He tried to console her. Um, there's this groaning of labor pains and I've seen it. So I understand what this means. And, and of course, after the birth, Right? This groaning pains is, is temporary. When, when the baby comes and she holds the baby, that, that pain is forgotten. And there's a smile on her face. And it says, I understand that the whole creation has been groaning in, groaning in labor pains until now. What is this? And not only the creation, but ourselves. We ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit. This refers to believers, just a person Christians, even us who have the fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly while we wait for the adoption, the redemption of our body. So even us, we, I mean, haven't you experienced that? When we go through our own challenges and trials and difficulties and we, we don't have the words to express, but uh, we, we groan uh, and hoping for some kind of redemption uh, for verse 24, for in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. I wonder what that means. But for who hope, who hopes for what is seen. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Just a few weeks ago, I was with uh, my high school classmates, and uh, they were asking me about being a pastor. And one of them said, uh, so, Verme, uh, I guess you give motivational sermons, right? Kind of give people some hope. And I said, yeah, you know, I, I, I try to. You know, in the sermons, I try to uh, be, be encouraging, um, be motivational. But sometimes, the Bible here says that it, it doesn't work. Sometimes the way we want it to work it can only be motivational if the people who hears the message understands that hope is based on something that is not seen. I'd like to explain that a little more because uh, if, we, if our hope is based on what we can see, what we can feel, then we don't get you know, what motivated by it. Uh, because there's a lot of challenges, discouragement, and the sermon will not work because, you know, we measure things differently. But we are Christians. What, what the Bible is saying is understand that we have something different. God is giving us a, a deeper kind of hope. So that's what, it's, what it says. Notice in, um, 
Even it says in 2 Corinthians 13, 14. Uh, before that, let me just continue reading this. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. So, in the world that we live in today, you know, there's this groaning, right? I mean, because of what's happening. And when we are so just fixed on the evidences of what we see, or even in our own personal groaning and complaining, and, and we are stuck or limited to what we feel or what we see, you know, and then we cannot appreciate that which is invisible, that which is of God, then we cannot fully understand and be motivated. Because our motivation only ends with the physical limitations of things that we can see. Uh, that's, so verse 26, likewise, well, this is an amazing thing because it's a promise. As we go through, God understands. So He understands how you feel now. We're groaning and sometimes we, we have this wistful thinking and we try, we try to work out our own encouragement, you know, but God is saying, you know, that doesn't work. And I want you to see that you have help. I want you to see that there is the Holy Spirit. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. So there is that introduction of God, the Holy Spirit. And that's what it says. The Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought. I mean, do you experience that? I experience that sometimes when I... There are things that I don't fully understand and... I, I don't have the right words, and I just, uh, you know, I just groan. And, and the Spirit, it says here, I, I find that really comforting, that, that the Holy Spirit helps us, you know, in, in, when, we, when we pray. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but, but that very Spirit intercedes with, with sighs to deep for words. God Himself intercedes. I mean, I, I am so encouraged when I receive letters or comments from people, from friends, and I'm sure you are too, when somebody intercedes for you, right? When somebody says, I pray for you, we think of you. That is so encouraging. But to see here, when, when God says that, that the Holy Spirit cares so much about us, that the Spirit of God prays or intercedes for us. Wow. We are not left on our own. We have someone. We have the Holy Spirit here with us. I mean, that to me is, wow, that is very encouraging. Well, what we have in this, in this particular scriptures that we have. So the Spirit intercedes to those people like a woman giving birth in pain. Or the whole world groaning. And I saw, I love this. Because just like uh, uh, not a long time ago, I, I got this message from, uh, you know, we have this new church plan, the Angie Tapin, and the associate pastor there is Nilo Bellarmino, who is with us. And uh, he had this pain on his lower back uh, that Tuesday, and so just, he never felt any pain, and he went to the hospital, the emergency room. And uh, that very hour, you know, they checked, and they found that he has uh, liver cancer, stage four, and he may not have much time. So when I saw that, you know, it's a good close friend of mine. He was once part of New Life. When I heard saw that news, I had this groaning thing. You know, this uh, this groaning. I cannot explain. I don't have the words and. One that is of concern for him, but one that is also hanging on to the hope because I cannot see, because from what I see, the evidence is pain. The evidence is a diagnostics, a diagnosis of stage four, and from that it feels like it's almost like hopeless. But thank God we have the Spirit who intercedes, and, and so I groan for that. Um, we all have experienced that whenever we... We have somebody calls and say, Burmy, your mom died. You know, I remember that, oh. Like when somebody says that, it's almost like there's finality. There is a period there, and there's nothing you can do about it. You know? And in fact, just yesterday, Angie, they went on vacation, pastor of the Grace GCF Communion uh, Fellowship. 
they went to the Philippines for a vacation because for four years they have not had a vacation. So they went there, uh, left the church for Nino Bellarmino, who has now the cancer and a few others. Uh, so uh, and he, he was telling us, you know, I was hoping for this vacation. And, and then uh, the other day, you know, yesterday, his, her husband was uh, with the brother-in-law and a little boy, a little child. Um, they were in a motorcycle with a cab and and then so I don't exactly know the detail, some accident happened, it flipped. And his brother-in-law hit the cement so hard at the back, his eyes pop out. And right there, uh, you know, Sadi Tabin is the pastor, you know, experienced that and he was, you know, Angie was saying, ah, oh, you know, we're hoping for this rest and we, for this vacation in the Philippines and uh, we leave somebody who's, you know, close to death and we arrive and after two days, you know, a few days, you know, we, we experienced this. And then when I saw this, again, I have this groaning in the spirit that I, I don't have words to, to express, uh, you know. And um, that's why here I can understand when the Bible says that the hope that, that we have is not based on what we see, because if I only look at the things and the events of what is happening, the accident and the pain and the diagnosis, it feels helpless and hopeless, and what can we do? But God has given us something through His Spirit, an understanding that there is something more. That in the midst of this pain and this trial, through God's Spirit, that our lives are never like a period. You know, oftentimes as Christians, we are very good story enders, and we say period all the time. But God oftentimes is a comma. You know, it's never, He never finishes that. You know, He continues uh, with that particular story. You know, and I heard the same thing when this deaconess I have in LA just a few weeks ago. We vis visited her in the morning, she was smiling and so forth. That night I got a call, Elnora Burks died. Ah. You know, you, you know that. We have Daniel Zamorano, you know, Ron and Carol there, you know, we, we have him and what a lovely man. And he goes through this as cancer too and we go through this process and, and sometimes say, that's it. It's a finality. Uh, the person is dead. Is that the end of the story? No. Now I propose to you that Pentecost tells us otherwise. You know, we have these events uh, that, that we have. We have. The death of Jesus Christ, that is an event, and that took care of the forgiveness of sin. That, that is done deal, you know, our sin washed away. Uh, then we have the resurrection where Jesus Christ is given a new life. And then we have the Pentecost. Now, these are good memories, we can, these, these are good events, but it doesn't end there. And it continues. And that's what Pentecost is about. Let, let me just illustrate this a little bit. The disciples, when, before they met Jesus, they were, I'm sure they felt a little bit discouraged because they were under the Roman Empire, right? And under the Roman Empire, Empire there is abuses, there is torture, it wasn't good, they were feeling low. And perhaps at that time they, they didn't have much hope, uh, you know, it's just a bleak kind of world that they have and they were powerless, there was a fisherman, and I know I'm going to die a fisherman, there was this tax collector, I'm, I'm going to die as a tax collector, there is Mary Magdalene who was living in, in sin, and, and probably that's, that's their life, but that particular story did not end there because Jesus Christ came and said, follow me. And when Jesus said that, suddenly the information and the data that they saw, whoa, you know, suddenly that hopelessness is not a period, God gave them more. God changed their story and he was moving them toward his own story, you know, story of hope. And, and they saw Jesus, he was doing miracles. He was saving lives and feeding people. And they got so excited about Jesus. And they said, surely Jesus will deliver us from the Roman Empire. We can be colonels and generals and wow, we, you know. Suddenly their life story changed, they got so excited, they were looking at the evidence, and the evidence points to the fact that, yeah, Jesus fits our story where he's going to overthrow the Roman Empire, that particular event. But then, Jesus Christ was arrested. Jesus Christ was put in jail, and he was tortured. So this narrative, this, this hope that they have, based on what they saw about that, began to change, and, and then 
They, they got helpless and felt hopeless, and they ran, started running away again and discouraged. You know? And then on the third day, Jesus rose again. Suddenly the whole thing began to change. The whole thing began to change, and they began to understand that hope is not really based on those moments and events, but something better, something, not just the death, the death which tells us of the forgiveness of sin, not just the resurrection, but that God continues even now, as He has this eternal purpose for us, which is already assured of, but even in this present life, the Holy Spirit works. The Holy Spirit is sent to us as the comforter, as the one who can intercede for us. You know, it says in Scripture where we have the fellowship with the Holy Spirit, that, that God is there and alive. That Jesus Christ is more than just a miracle worker. Jesus Christ is more than just a deliverer, you know, the Roman, not that empire, but uh, something deeper, something more. And that's what the Spirit has for us. Now, don't get me wrong, those pain and, and grief and suffering, those are real. But the purpose of God for each of us, the beautiful things and promises of God for you and me are more real. More real than the pain that we experience now. Because it's so easy for us to, to see the tragedies and the hardship around us. It, it's easier to, to do that. But uh, those disciples learn you cannot put a period when God says, not yet, not this particular time. You know, no. God puts a comma where I continue to work with you. Powerlessness, this feeling of weakness, and sometimes be just the place where the Spirit of God works mightily. For sometimes the Bible says, for it is in weakness that we are able to see better who God really is. The world fantasizes about the strong ones, the popular ones. But Jesus Christ comes and says, Come unto me, all of you who are tired and weary. Matthew 11, verse 28. Let's go to Matthew 11, verse 28. Matthew 11, verse 28. It says, Come unto me, all ye who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I think that's very clear here. Matthew 20, verse 16. For those who are in this world that are groaning in pain and suffering, those who have stayed for, those who are unemployed, those who have broken relationships, whatever it is, so where you think that your life has already ended, where you think your life is already a period, that's when God enters and says, no, no, I'm not done with you. I send you the Spirit there, and, the, and I continue to be there for you. That's what it says. Matthew 20, 20 verse 16. Uh, let me read that. Matthew 20, 16. So the last will be first, and the first will be last. So he, even this is saying, that, you know, for God, some of you, you know, these people who think, oh, oh my, I'm the last. You know, it's too late. I mean, we all this thinking, you know, stinking thinking? <laughs> this, this thinking that can make us feel so discouraged. When God, for God says, no, 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 no. With my economy, uh, the last will be first. I mean, I, I do care. That's what God says. God's strength is perfect in our weaknesses. And the Spirit of God intercedes. The Holy Spirit intercedes. God is writing. God is still sighing and groaning, loving us into redemption. It's never done. It's never done. 
So, you know, Pentecost uh, is a day in which the church was born. That's how we look at it. Because the outpouring of the Holy Spirit came and made evident at the time by the tongues of flames and rushing wind that creates a community of be believers and saints empowered by all of them and sharing the goodness of Jesus to the community and, and to the world. That's, that's why we say it's the birth. And, and so there goes to our connected, the coming of the Spirit and the birth of the church because that was made possible. So when we celebrate Pentecost, we celebrate the coming, the introduction, the coming, and the greater understanding of the Spirit. But it's not just there as an event for us to remember. You know, festivals have meanings, and we commemorate them. But when we, we, all, we, when we stop at only at the commemoration and the remembrance, and forget that they have present personal application, that's when we, we go wrong. Because these have ongoing. Pentecost is not done. It is not over. You know, the Bible begins with the book of Genesis and ends with the book of Revelation. And in the middle right there is the book of Acts. And the story of the Acts is the Acts of the Apostle, the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And it's still ongoing. The work of the Spirit is ongoing even now. And as it says that the whole world is groaning, and even personally it says all of us are groaning, but God sends the Spirit and He intercedes for us. The Pentecost event is happening now, not only in the world, not only in the church, but it is, it is happening in your own personal life. I mean, do, you, do you hear that from the Spirit? Maybe the better question is, do we believe that, that the Holy Spirit is alive and, and working today? It didn't just happen once long, long time ago. They happened. That event of the outpouring of God's Spirit during Pentecost, and if you look at the book of Acts, in multiple times, the Spirit of God is poured out. And amazing things happen. People coming to faith. The church growing. When you see all these miracles, we see all this work of the Spirit continuing on, continuing to the church and, and until now. It never ended. Sometimes we can get discouraged, maybe when a particular church, so there's an attack at this church. Oh, we are, you know, we close this church because they have to run away. I mean, we look at history, but it never ends. God continues. And, and it, we experience the same thing when we have to consolidate churches. And, you know, I understand, you know, I love, you know, people with new life and Beaumont. There was a time when what will happen to us? We don't have the ministers. And is this going to be a period? It's going, we have all these questions about, and we're groaning, God, what, is this the end of our congregations? What happens now? But, but as we have seen, the Holy Spirit is not done with us. There is more for us that the Spirit has prepared. We may not fully understand it, but there is something. And uh, we've seen all of this work, and it does, it does not stop with the book of Acts. There's all kinds of history uh, as, we, as, we, as we see. So Pentecost is not over. And uh, we should not be surprised by that because Jesus himself made an astounding statement that, that I find very difficult to understand when he said in John 14, verse 12, Truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, I will do greater, and in fact, will do greater works than these. You know, that's a wall, you know, that, that the work of Jesus through the Holy Spirit continues on and that will be amazing things that God will do. We're not talking about salvation, we're talking about the continuing relationship we have with God and, and what He wants to do so that the gospel can continue to, to progress and, and to move on. So, as Christians, we, we believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are a people this, we are a people as a church whose story is not uh, finished. A people for whom God says uh, there is more. 
Daniel Zamorano, you may have died, but God is saying he has more. You will just move on into another level of existence, but God has so much more for Daniel. God has so much more for Jude Pueblo's dad, and it never ends, and even now it does not end that way. You know, that's, we see that in our own life. I remember when I, was, when I was young in elementary, I was, oh, I just want to be in high school, you know. I see my brothers, they're so happy. It's, oh, high school life is it, and after that, I'm just happy if I reach high school. And when we went to high school, you know, it's a lot of fun. And then, oh, college. Oh, if I just can go to college, I would be so happy. You know, life did not end with high school. Did it? No, no, it's never a period, but it's a continuation. We went to college, and after college, you know, oh, I want to get married, you know. <laughs> Ah, we got married, you know. I got married, uh, met my wife in college, you know, and uh, oh, we want to have children, and um, you know, it, it continues on. That's that's life, and and from that first breath that we were given by God, it continues on. It doesn't. It's not a period, but this life, even the next life, is going to be beautiful. That what God has prepared for us, for you, uh, for me. And then we got Ben, our oldest son, and we were so happy. Of course, my wife, when she was giving birth, like groaning, no more, burn me, I don't want any more. And, uh, and then when the baby came out, and it's a cute baby, and my wife said, one more? <laughs> and it continued, the second one, the third one, fourth one, and at the fourth one, I said, no more. <laughs> But you know what I mean is that it, it is a continuous uh, joy uh, with, with God. Within, within our suffering, there's always more. God does not abandon us. When we think our lives are hopeless because we are older, because we are sickly, when the things that we see don't give us hope, there is the Holy Spirit right there in us interceding for us, you know, right there, never abandoning us, and he doesn't ever, ever neglect us. It's never what we see. The disciples saw Jesus, uh, even in, in the wilderness. Whenever they see something, they get their hope, and then they lose something, they rebel, and then they see another hope. It's kind of up and down, and in the same way, even in the book of Acts, there's those people who receive the Spirit and even witness this tongues of flame and, and conversion. But if you know the story of the church, you know that it's not always nice and dandy. You know, there's a lot of persecution. So if, if their hope is only limited to the physical, you know, things that we see, then this message is going to be really depressing. Because this message about Pentecost is not about the things that we, we see and the evidence, but it's about something deeper that God has for each and every one of us. So deep that even transcends our own death. But even if, you know, like what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they have this, oh, we're going to be thrown in all the love, and there's going to be a period, you know. That's it, that's the end, the death, you know. But God, then they were having this hope, hope that, well, we know God is going to rescue us, you know. And this is what makes Christian hope different. You know, the wistful thinking is, I, I know God is going to rescue us. Oh, I wish God is going to do this, going to rescue us. And the deeper hope is, but if not, O oh King, we will still continue our relationship with God. You know, I'm not removing the fact that God heals today. That God can totally resurrect or resuscitate the dead, right? But if not, it's okay. It's okay. And, I, and your life has not ended. My life has not ended because God has something more. Some of you have experienced, and I, even in this, I see the Pentecost event happening, not only with our congregations, but, you know, if I may use Mr. Lipros, Roger Lipros, who 
was so faithful in the church and has served and retired and even had this ailment. You know, people might say, period. period. You know, but no, God say, no, Roger, it's a common. There's more. So God has more and it continues on. It never stopped even with the last breath that we have. And he has been, even his retirement, continued on serving, doing whatever he can, serving with Bangladesh, serving in the church. And he was even saying to me, I think I'm strong now and I can speak. You know, uh, Pastor Neeler, the same way, he retired. But he's never a period. He's still a comma. <laughs> you know? He's still going on. And even when he goes, people of God, nothing stops them from doing work. Even if we are on our deathbed, we can still continue on praying and, and hoping, hope, you know, with a lot of you, Barb Edwards retired, but continues on. Doesn't mean to say that you retired, you retired. You know, retired simply means you change your tires. <laughs> well, that, that's a, an attempt to joke. <laughs> So, that, you know, th there is a reality to, so even when we look at this event, this, this uh, event that we have, the death of Jesus Christ, it has some, a personal application for us. You know, yes, through the death, everything is accomplished, tetelestai. style. But we can still ask, and it's okay to ask, okay, are there things in my life that needs to be put to death? You know, doesn't mean to say, that, ah, I'm saved, so therefore we continue living you know, our own lives and, but is there, is there something where we can we should surrender them to God? And then the resurrection, perhaps we can ask the question, um, is there something in my relationships that perhaps needs a new life? You know? Is there something in my, the way I look at this? Sometimes we have this pet theology that we hold on to, legalistic or whatever, and we don't want to get rid of it, perhaps God wants you to look at it from a new life? Are we willing to change that? Not, not to resuscitate, but to give new life. You know? And then Pentecost is God is there for us and He intercedes and what should I do that I may continue in faith and, and follow, follow our Lord, our Lord Jesus. I mean, that, that is an amazing thing. And in first Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 2, if I may go to 2 Corinthians 3, 2. You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everybody. Verse 3. You show that you are a letter from Christ. The result of our ministry, written not in ink, but with the Spirit. Oh, the Spirit of the living God. Can you see that? That Jesus Christ is the author of your life? Isn't that amazing? Annette Williams. The story of Annette Williams, written by Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Who, everybody here, your story, Mike Delote, is written by J.K. Rowling. <laughs> I don't want my name, I, you know, I want Jesus to be the author. I mean, that, wow! Isn't that going to be a beautiful story that Jesus is the author and is written up with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, so the Pentecost event continues because through God's Spirit, our lives are being written. He's involved, He intercedes, He groans for us, He's our comforter. Pentecost continues on and on for eternity. Uh, that, well, I, I, I am so encouraged by, by that. But then again, this is something, this hope that we don't see. Because some of us may be unemployed. Some of us are experiencing, feeling certain pain right now. Some of us are getting old. You know, I'm 45, I'm getting old. <laughs> you know, if we look at that, you know, that's why we don't believe in health and wealth, because people are looking at those evidence that gives them joy and happiness. No, it's not that. 
Yes, if God gives health and wealth, hallelujah, praise God. But if not, I still continue to love God and because he, he loved me first. Hebrews 12, 2 also says, I fix my eyes on Jesus because he is the author and the finisher of my faith. Who finished the story for us? Jesus Christ. So whatever state we are in, the resurrection event, the Pentecost are not just events, but they are answers to problems of endings. You know, where we think, oh, this is it. I am hopeless. There's nothing else I can do. I cannot walk properly. I mean, we have all these reasons. The resurrection and the Pentecost are God's messages for you and me. God is never finished with you. And that's how he loves us so much. Our stories are still being written. That's what's beautiful about, about this. And um, so Jesus Christ promised the Holy Spirit for you and uh, for me. And the Spirit is acting. So I, before I close, I have a suggestion to make for me and for you. I see these Pentecost moments in our congregation. I see it with the kids singing here, and I see it in the congregation who understands that even though they're kids and they may not be perfect in the way you might think, but your love and your understanding is there. I, I, see, I see the work of the Spirit expanded, this vision of that work, and you are all part of that. You know, the Spirit falls fresh on us. And so I invite and challenge you to see in our congregation and to see in your individual lives this new Pentecost. Open your eyes and see. And see that, what God is doing. I invite us to share with each other, share in our conversation this coming week and in the future how you see the Spirit being active in your life. Maybe you can talk about it, you know, during meal. How is the Spirit active in your life? So I invite you to wonder, you know, and be curious with about, I wonder the future. I wonder what and when and where the next Pentecost will be in my congregation, in our denomination, in my personal life, in my family. God cares about our families. Where might this community of faith, this grace life, how will it respond to God's call as we are empowered by the Holy Spirit? You know, think about it. However you decide, whatever, you know, just that's something that we can consider and think about. So let's not just uh, talk about Pentecost, but let us trust the next Pentecost event that is going to happen in your life, in your family, and in this congregation. And, uh, and I see this right, I mean, what was written in Romans. The world is full of trouble. We also groan, but don't get discouraged. God loves you dearly and cares for you. He is writing a beautiful story written by Jesus Christ. And it's going to be very beautiful. Amen? Amen. Thank you, God, for sharing with us today that the day of Pentecost and what happened, Lord God, continues to happen. And even in our, in our church and in our personal lives, Lord, help us to see that and be encouraged. Lord, that you will never leave us, you will never forsake us. And help us also look into the future, Lord, on what you plan to do. So that we can take part in what Jesus Christ will do in our communities, in our families. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen.